All right. We are starting the what 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 will we say at the the race to the finish line. Um, we are over halfway through the semester, and I every semester I can't believe when we make it to this point because it seems to happen so quick. Um, the impact of that is that um, the project is going to become increasingly important. So you should, if you haven't thought about that, you should start thinking about that. Um, also, if you're a little behind, you should probably put forth the effort to try to catch up. Um, let's see. I can't remember where we left off exactly. I know what I'm going to talk about today. But I can't remember grid layout. 1018, what day was that? Was that Wednesday? Yes. OK. Yeah, I, had a, uh, I, I, thought, I thought that was Wednesday. I actually had an issue in Wednesday's lecture that I want to go over. And I want to show you what I did to correct it. Because it was a very small mistake. But again, if you haven't gotten used to that by now, um, very small mistakes can have huge impact in, in your coding. Um, the problem I had, and I'll recreate the error, and then I'll fix it again. Because I've, I've uploaded the fixed version to Canvas. So I'll recreate the error to show you the problem that I was having, and then uh, I'll fix it. The problem I had was like this. I had this code here. And I added a wrapper to it. A wrapper is the one little change that we made to the HTML to allow us to do the grid uh, layout. If I knew I was going to do the grid layout, um, I would have done that initially. But um, I sort of added that on as, as something new to do. Um, and it should be a 2 by 2 grid, because according to my style sheet, I've defined the grid as having two columns, 400 by 400 pixels. Now. When I view this, though, looks like that. It's not two columns, 400 by 400 pixels. And the problem was, was pretty subtle, small. If you notice, in my HTML, I made an ID of wrapper, which I thought was good, because there's only going to be one thing that wraps around all the content on the page. There's not going to be two um, things with that ID. Yet in the CSS, I define a style rule for the class of wrapper. All right, An ID versus a class. I could fix this either way. I could change the where it says ID equals wrapper. I could change that to class equals wrapper. Or I could change where it says, uh, defines a style rule for a class of wrapper and change it to define a style rule for an ID of wrapper. I'm pretty comfortable with wrapper being an ID, so I'll change the style rule to use an ID of wrapper instead of a class. Yes? Um, well, this wasn't what I was going to say, but you're missing a semicolon after the 400 pixels. Yeah. Um, but, but why does it do like grid wrap? I don't know. Uh, Notepad++ um, does a, a pretty good job um, like editing different sorts of files, but it's not perfect. My guess is, is that given that 
grid gap and grid template are relatively new things, it doesn't recognize those as being legit CSS. Okay. That would be my guess of, of why it does it. I guess I don't know for sure. So anyhow, I put a pound sign in front of it to match the fact that it's a class and save everything and boom, I'm back in business and I have a grid. Uh, this grid layout is pretty cool. It is relatively new. Uh, it was just implemented under uh, the Edge browser. So this should work in Edge as well. Let's verify this. Provided we have the right version of Edge, now that I think about it. We might have an older version of Edge on this machine. And we do. All right. Wow. Um, this is sort of a problem. Let's see how it looks in Internet Explorer. Looks like that. Interesting. This is a perfect segue into my next topic, which is browser compatibility. All right. Uh, I didn't plan on that, but it's actually good that that happened. Um, probably one of the biggest challenges for people that are in web development is the fact that you have no control about what your user has on the other end, as far as what kind of hardware they have, what kind of uh, browser they're using. So are they on a Windows machine, or are they on a Mac? Or are they on a Linux machine? You know, what, what hardware is the machine? Uh, is it a mobile device? Is it a tablet? Is it a smartphone? Is it a flip phone? All right, is it an in a Nintendo DS? I could browse the internet on my Nintendo DS, or my Xbox, all right, or whatever. So you have absolutely no control about what the user has on the other end. And yet, your job is to make your web page work across as many platforms as possible. That's really the trick, right? Is to make your, your web page work across as many uh, platforms as possible where you have no control about what kind of platforms they have. So what do you do, all right? This is a huge problem in the past when browsers tried to compete with each other and would add features that the other browsers didn't have. Um, that was very bad for the web development business. All right? Nowadays, the trend is to go for standards. And standards makes our life easier. So that's why I've been preaching throughout the semester using proper use of HTML and CSS. These standards are standards across the board, and all browsers should implement them. But here's where the challenge comes in. The standards evolve as the browsers are evolving. So it isn't like browser makers sit there and wait for the standard to be finalized and then go out and make their web browsers or their changes to the web browsers. The standards evolve. In other words, they put out uh, a statement, the, the standards organization, a W3C, puts out statements that say, well, you know, this is our draft, rough draft of, of a standard. So this could be changed. And browser makers try to implement parts of that standard. But they can't do everything all at once, so they just do parts of it. So with HTML5 uh, and CSS3, uh, the problem is, is that some browsers implement parts of the code uh, standard and some browsers don't. So what do you do? Well, at the very least, you want to have what's called graceful degradation. Now, what does graceful degradation mean? Graceful degradation is where you have a web page that may not look perfect for all browsers, but is at least workable in all browsers. So for example, in this case, I brought up Edge. The web page doesn't look very good, but at minimally, it's functional still. All right? I would want to do better than this, but if I could not, at the very least, the page would be functional in these browsers. Hopefully, we can do a little bit better than that, though. All right? Now.
one of the things that we can do for very old browsers is apply style sheets to help this out. There, there's actually a style sheet that you can apply for old versions of Firefox, and there is a style sheet that you can apply for old versions of the Microsoft browsers. All right. In this case, we don't need to, to apply the, whoa, we don't need to apply the Firefox one. But I'm going to do it anyhow, just in case we had an older version, because this looks exactly the same as it does in Google Chrome. It's important that you test your code in multiple browsers. All right? You even want to go so far as to test your code in multiple versions of the browser. Because, um, again, changes happen between versions of browsers, and standards evolved, and you want to see how your page looks in a variety of environments. Usually what I do is when I put out a page, I'll contact my friends and say, hey, can you pull up this page and look at it? Now, that's not a very scientific way to do it, right? But at least I will hopefully get a range of people using different browsers. I'm going to see if I have this code to download. If not, I'll create it. So let's see here. All right, I'm going to copy the code into into my I'm just copying files now, so I'm I don't it doesn't bother me that the screen is um, not being displayed. All right. Here's some code that I can put in that will help browser compatibility. And this is covered in the book, but um, it will also be um, um, also um, will now be in, in this example and the next example that I cover. First of all, I have a external style sheet just for Firefox. It's called ff. Dot CSS. Now, this is something that we haven't seen yet, and this will form the basis of when we talk about mobile development. Notice there are two style sheets. If there are two style sheets, which one takes precedence? Well, look at it this way. The first style sheet is used and sets the base. 
And then the second style sheet overrules anything in the first style sheet. All right? So first style sheet gets applied, then the second style sheet sort of gets applied over top of it. All right? So if there happen to be two things in common in the two style sheets, the one in the second style sheet would win. <clears throat> in this case, though, there's really some very basic code in the Firefox example. The Firefox example simply does this. It tells the browser that any header, nav, section, article, aside, and footer, by default, is a block tag. All right? Keep in mind the purpose of this. This is for ancient versions of Firefox that were written before HTML5 was implemented in Firefox. So this simply, this doesn't make your old versions of Firefox completely HTML5 compatible. But it allows this functionality. It allows the use of these tags and these tags to be treated correctly. Because really, that's, all, that's what these things are. A header is a block tag. A, a, a footer is a block tag, and so on. All right? So this is the Firefox sort of hack. People talk about hacks. And what hacks are are typically little extra things that you have to do to get something to work. The Internet Explorer one is a little more involved. And I didn't write this one. It's a little snippet of JavaScript called the HTML5 shiv. And you can look, at, uh, look for it online. And I actually downloaded it to my local machine. And it's really just a, uh, a snippet of JavaScript. And again, I don't expect you to understand the way that JavaScript works, but just know that it is JavaScript and know what its job is. Its job is to make earlier versions of Internet Explorer recognize the basic HTML5 tags. That is, the header, footer, aside, section, and so on. So now, if I go and view this page, That was weird. Notice what it did. Before, there was no style sheets applied because uh, HTML, uh, uh, Internet Explorer, whatever version this is, this is probably Internet Explorer 8, didn't recognize it. So now, I at least allowed Internet Explorer to recognize those basic HTML5 tags. So it still doesn't understand grid views, or, or I'm sorry, not grid views, but grid layouts. Uh, so it doesn't do it perfectly. But at least this is workable, and this is better than the basic version that we had before. All right? Now, again, I've noticed that fewer and fewer people are using the old, old browsers. But it's still a consideration, because you never know when there's a machine like this one that uses those old browsers. How far back do you have to go in supporting browsers and testing? Well, that's an interesting question. You can go online for browser usage statistics, but those are actually very hard to gather. All right? In other words, you can find some variants. And they talk a little bit about the accuracy of this. And the statement is, is that as of September 2017, Chrome has 55%, Safari has 14%, Edge has 2.1%, IE has 3.5%, and so on. 
So you might ask yourself, is it worth it to do something in your code for just a very small percentage? And the answer typically is, is yeah. If it's something simple that you can do um, to make those people's experiences better, then why not do it? Um, would you have a, a physical store that kept out even 3% of the possible? Of course you wouldn't. All right. So even though that number seems a small amount, it actually um, is, is fairly significant. Um, again, here's other statistics. What I don't like about these is it doesn't show the versions to know how, old, how far people go back. But again, the bottom line is if you just adopt the rule that, hey, any HTML page that you get you put this code in, the little Firefox fix, and this HTML5 shift for older versions of Internet Explorer, and then you have, they have those taken care of, at least taken care of as well as uh, you can. There actually is a chart on this page, actually a number of charts, a website called Can I Use that tells you what browsers support what. So, for example, can I use a CSS grid? Notice that versions of Chrome 49, iOS, uh, uh, iOS Safari 10.2 and Android browser 4.4 don't support it. This sort of olive, or, or I don't know, what would you call that? Sort of a, I guess olive, green color means it's partially supported. The green means that it is supported. So you can look through these features and get an idea of what browsers and what versions of browsers support them and what versions of browsers don't support them. All right? Again, that doesn't mean that you don't use the new features, all right? But you make sure that on browsers where the new, uh, new features aren't supported, that at the very least, your page looks OK. So for example, if we view this page in Internet Explorer, the one that had the grid layout, It doesn't look exactly as we intended. It's not in a grid layout. But at the very least, it's workable. And it looks reasonably well. So again, that's the idea of graceful degradation, that if a browser doesn't support something, then at the very least, it will still look OK and be workable. This is very hard for some designers to get through their heads, because again, a lot of graphics designers came from the world of print. And like I talked about last time or the time before, in print, you can define exactly what a magazine layout is going to look like. And it'll look like that for everyone. In the web world, though, when you define a web page, you don't get that, right? Because you have to live with the fact that people are going to be accessing um, your pages from a variety of different devices, a variety of different hardware platforms, using a variety of different software. All right. So standards and flexibility, plus being aware of what, what, what browser versions support what, being aware of some of the hacks you can use to fix that, and testing, 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 is the key to browser and platform compatibility. Now, all this has become incredibly more involved and complicated with the advent of mobile devices. Right? Mobile devices are truly a game changer. Um, because people uh, are, are increasingly using mobile devices to access the internet. Um, in some cases, for some individuals, more so than they would use a desktop device. All right. Now, people can access online stuff, and I'm being vague on purpose, a couple different ways. One is via online websites. 
All right. So in other words, I have a mobile device. I can I can go and search Google. All right. Or I can view ESPN. I can do that on my mobile phone. Um, I can also, in many cases, also download a mobile application. Like, for example, I'm sure ESPN has a mobile application. What are the advantages and disadvantages of using a mobile application versus using a mobile website? Less navigating. Less navigating in which case? For which option? For the app. For the app, yeah. The apps are usually straightforward. So for example, let's say I wanted to see what the weather is going to be today. All right. If I had the weather.com app downloaded, I could press a button and the weather is going to be in my face. Right? It's right there. All right. Um, so it's very, very, very simple. I could, if that was important to me, I could put it on my phone's desktop. Right? And boom. I can go in and view it. Think of what I would have to do if I was accessing it via a, a mobile web browser. I'd have to open up my browser. All right. I would have to navigate to weather.com. I might have to put my zip code in if, if it didn't remember it, and so on and so forth. And again, as was mentioned, I could have multiple tabs open. I could have all those things. So, uh, apps typically provide a little, little higher level of convenience. All right. What are some other advantages or disadvantages of using a mobile application versus a mobile website? Yes. Okay. A lot of times, the apps don't necessarily have full content. All right. So there may be some things that you can do on a website that you can't do on an app. On an app, they carefully pick stuff. Whereas with a web, uh, uh, with a website, you have the full capabilities of the web. So you can, for example, if if there was a word on a web on, uh, on a mobile website that you didn't understand, you could easily crack open a new tab and do a search for it and find out what that word is. Where you might have to close the app or, or minimize the app, go to another page, whatever, uh, with an app. So that's true as well. Other advantages or disadvantages? Yes? Um, maybe for like, to use like the ESPN one, like maybe I just want to know something about a player, and like that's it, so I just go to the website and look. Uh -huh. Rather than why would I want to have the ESPN app if I want to use it? Exactly. Uh, the mobile web is available to anyone that has a web browser. Right. So uh, the, the example the, the student gave is, what if I wanted to look something up on ESPN's website, but I didn't necessarily want to go through the trouble of downloading the app? All right. You can access mobile websites if you have a browser on your phone. And even flip phones typically have browsers on, on the phone. All right. So therefore, uh, that, that's the whole benefit of the web. You don't have to download app after app after app. You can simply go and navigate to that. Other advantages or disadvantages? Yes? Exactly. Uh, the space on your phone. Uh, in addition to the hassle of downloading it, when you download apps, um, you know, it, it uh, you know, it, it takes up space. It's amazing. Like every time I get a new phone, they tell me like how much space is on it. You know, 16 gigs or whatever. And I think, oh my God, that's going to last me the rest of my life. You know, and what's it last? It lasts the next three months. And all of a sudden, you can't download this app because your phone is full. What? You know, and again, and therefore, in addition to the hassle of downloading an app, it takes up space on your phone. Uh, where a mobile browser, again only takes up space like while you're downloading and viewing uh, it. And, and that, that's really a minimal space. So you don't really have to download anything new. It's not going to really take up any more on your phone. Other advantages or disadvantages? It's a great list that we have. A uh, couple other ones I would say is that apps, one good thing about apps is that apps can more easily integrate with other things on the phone. For example, to integrate uh, an app with your phone or your contacts. Um, I said phone, but I meant camera. To integrate an app with your camera or contacts or share to Facebook 
or this or that. Typically, that's easy with apps. Keep in mind that there's a lot of advances made in both areas. And uh, again, some of the functionality uh, that you can do on one, one is very, you can, you, can, you can do a lot of the same functionality on the other. Uh, another example is that a website, uh, to access a website, typically you would have to be connected to the internet. Well, some apps, you can, you can do stuff offline. All right? Um, you know, if you wanted to play Tetris online, um, you'd have to be connected to the web. If you've downloaded the Tetris app, you can play it even if you're not connected to the web. Probably. All right. Um, here's like the spoiler alert, though. All right. Guess what organizations do? Which do you think most organizations choose to implement? A mobile website or an app? Spoiler alert. All of the above. All right. Most organizations go and say, well, we want an app to get all the great benefits of our app. All right. Uh, we can have more control over the content with the app. We can sort of direct users. Uh, someone said that an that a, a app doesn't necessarily have full content. Well, you can, you can really control that a lot better you know, with an app. You can make sure people don't block your ads with an app. All right, where well, you can't do that with a website. There's ad blockers and stuff like that. Um, but most people don't want to close out the people that aren't going to download the app either. So they want to make their, their websites uh, compatible as well. So the truth is, is that most organizations would take both strategies to try to implement an application and to try to make their website mobile compatible. All right. Um, the one thing we didn't mention about apps that I do want to mention is um, developing uh, apps requires, uh, if you're developing apps, you actually have to develop different versions for different platforms. So there's an iOS app and there is uh, an Android app. Whereas a web page theoretically should work on anything, even on a desktop machine. All right? Now, we're not going to talk any more about apps. All right. We might mention them, but we're not really going to focus on them. This is a web development class, so we're going to focus on web development stuff. All right. Now, um, how is accessing the web on a phone different than accessing the web um, on a desktop machine or even a laptop? Screen smaller. All right. What? a touch screen instead of a mouse. What is, let's look at these one at a time. What is the impact of the screen being smaller? How does that affect your experience? You might have to scroll. All right. Possibly easy to miss content. Yeah, you can zoom in or make the fonts bigger. It could potentially load slow. Uh, that doesn't really have anything to do with the size of the screen, but that is another problem with mobile websites. Typically, when you're connected, depending on how you're connected to the web, it's typically going to be a slower page load uh, or a longer page load time on a mobile device versus that, uh, versus a, a desktop device. Other thoughts? Yes. Re repeat that, please. You mean on a, a mobile, a web, yeah, mobile website? Right. Um, all these things, uh, the, the, the statement was made that you would keep a mobile website maybe a little more simpler and straightforward, all right, due to the fact that the screen is smaller. So we have probably slower downloads. We have a smaller screen. We have a different way of interacting with that, a touch screen rather than a mouse. All these things point to the fact that on mobile devices, simpler is probably better. All right? You may have less content on a page, for example. 
You may not show a, a background image on a page. Something that looks great on a desktop might be a lot harder to view on a mobile device, and so on. All right? Now, when you're developing a mobile website, you have a couple of choices of the, of the, of the path that you take. And we'll talk about three choices, and we'll probably spend most of our time talking about the, the second option. All right? Oh, what did I do? I zoomed in on myself. One option is, I finally got this camera uh, straightened out when uh, a very frustrated and I think exhausted student pointed out to me that this is not the camera, this is the light, this is the camera. So once I was, it was like, oh, okay. All right, one thing that you can do on a website is a one size fits all. That's where you have a web design that works with no changes on a mobile device and on a desktop device. Is it possible to do that? Sure, it's possible to do that. It's especially possible to do that if you're talking about a smaller website where there's not dozens of links and, and all that, just a handful of links. So it's possible to develop a website that will look good on a desktop device and will look good on a, um, uh, a mobile device. What's the key to that? Well, one thing is using percentages rather than pixels. A simple site, simple layout maybe one column or use a floating layout that's the one size fit all so we sort of have an idea how that would go I would think for example the first or second design I did the first or second prototype I did uh, for Star Wars would probably look okay on a mobile device let's go and verify that All right, that's close to being okay. You can't see it. That's close to being okay on a mobile site. There's really one thing wrong about that, and we'll, we'll talk about correcting that um, when we go over our example. So this is getting there as being a design that would look okay on a mobile device. But the only thing is, is that the font and stuff is way too small. All right, if we can fix that problem, then, then we'll be in good shape. And that would look about the same on a desktop device. So we're not going to talk about that too much, all right? Because you do these things, you have a fighting chance of making a one-size-fits-all. The third option, we'll skip number two. The third option is actually having two different sites. So that when you access one website, a website from a mobile device, there's a little traffic cop on the web server that directs you to the mobile, mobile version of the page. And if you access the same site from a desktop machine, the traffic cop directs you to the full version of the site. I'm trying to think of sites that do that. Excellent question. When you send a request to a web server, remember I had this diagram? I have the client connected to the internet. 
that sends a request to a web server and gets a response back and the response they get back is an HTML page when you send a request you're gonna send the request to a URL so let's say website all right there's also other information you send you send information about what browser you're using so this request contains the URL but also it contains what browser you're using what operating system you're using what hardware you're using uh, maybe not hardware but operating system browser definitely and that information can be used by the server to figure out what platform you're on and therefore using server-side scripting which we haven't talked about in this class they can customize uh, they, they, they can actually traffic direct you to one site versus another you may have seen this and let me let me see if I can find a site quickly that does this the problem with this is examples like things change all the time okay I went to ebay.com all right let's go to ebay.com I get sent to www.ebay.com all right here on my mobile phone and you're welcome to do this if you want probably the first time ever that a teacher is telling you to pull out your phone and play with it if you want but open up your web browser and go to ebay.com and at least on my phone let me zoom in notice that the address changed to m.ebay.com so eBay's web server has a traffic cop that looks at every request that comes in and if it's coming in from a desktop it directs you to the www.ebay.com if it's coming in from a mobile it directs you to the mobile version of the site and what do they do on the mobile version of the site well if you look this is all the things that we talked about it's simpler it's one column all right well my phone just went into screensaver mode and so on all right so it takes you to a site that is simpler that little animation doesn't exist on that page all right and so on so we don't talk about that in this class either we will talk about that if you take CISS 268 which is mobile web development all right there's a variety of things that we can do via scripting whether it be server-side scripting or client-side scripting to make this happen all right so that's option three option two is what's often called responsive web design and if you think about it we want the most flexible sort of layout so all the things that we said about the simple design the one-size-fit-all design applies here so we want to use percentages not pixels we probably want to use floating or one column and there's one more ingredient the use of what are called media queries all right media queries and that's the missing piece that we're going to talk about in the next example all right we'll start this example today and we'll finish it uh, next time 
How many of you have ever printed a web page? Like you go to a news article and you print it. Does the printout look exactly like the web page? No. How does it look different? Some cases it is. What about cases where it looks different? Okay, if you're printing an article, maybe it wouldn't show ads. Were you? Exactly. It would be a very simplified version of it. Um, it uh, it wouldn't. It might not contain. It might not show like the links, for example, because you can't l click on a sheet of paper to go to another page, right? So the navigation is useless in that case, and so on. Now, did you ever think how they do that? All right, they do that by using what's called a media query, and a media query says. Depending on certain parameters, use this style sheet or use that style sheet. So what they actually do is they have two style sheets. One style sheet that applies when the page is being displayed on a screen, and one style sheet when a page is being displayed on or is going to be printed. All right. So the style sheet that displays that, that sends it to the printer is simplified, gets rid of stuff, doesn't show navigation, and so on. So in that way, you don't have two. You, it's not like there's two copies of the page, right? That would be horrible to have to write two versions of the page: one version to print out, one version to display on the screen. There is instead one version of the HTML, two versions of the CSS. All right, and that's exactly what we can do with mobile devices. I'm going to bring up this example, and it, I'll, I'll make sure it's available on Canvas so you can look at it. Um, here is a page. This go responsive. Here's what the page looks like on a desktop browser. All right? I'm not holding this up as a well-designed page. This is just for demonstration purposes. This is, uh, but you can see that it's more complicated, or it's complicated. There's a background image. Um, there is uh, white text. There is a little image there. Notice that as I resize the page, the image changes size. All right? Now, same page viewed in a mobile browser looks like that, sort of like the print version. It's a much simplified version of the page. So how do we do this? We do this sort of like we did with the Firefox thing. We have two style sheets, one that applies in the case of a desktop and one that applies in the case of a uh, mobile device. Actually, that's not entirely correct, but we can pretend that that's correct for now. All right, we'll clarify this next time. So the idea is, is that we have one HTML, two style sheets. This is one of the reasons why I had you write like the same lab with two different style sheets, to get used to this thought that you can display the same content different ways. And we'll use this to our advantage with mobile. Uh, uh, mobile web pages. Now, next time in class we'll review to actually what a media query looks like and how we use it to make it happen. So we'll review that next time. All right, we'll see you up in lab.